Okay, very simple outline of the talk. So I'm going to describe a problem which is developing in operational meteorology. Um, I'm going to then describe solution and what we're doing about the problem. And finally, at the end, I'm going to summarize things and ask the question, are we on the right track or not? So, uh, yeah. So first of all, I thought I'd start off by saying a little bit about why, why we need new sources of data uh, for weather forecasting. Um, well, um, I guess the main reason is that um, a lot of um, severe weather occurs on quite small scales. Um, and there are economic benefits if we can forecast severe weather. Um, obviously it enables us to better target warnings and the better warnings are targeted, the more effective uh, mitigations um, are. Um, now, historically, um, a lot of small scale weather, we haven't really attempted to forecast. And it's only in, in recent years that um, forecast models have become powerful enough uh, that it becomes a possibility. So an example of that is fog. So this is a map of visibility in the London area. And I'm sorry, there's no scale on the map, but basically the area of the map is very roughly the area enclosed by the M25. And the um, uh, there are some places marked by crosses, including the, the London airports. Uh, and it shows very graphically that, that fog is very small or can be a very small scale phenomenon. Um, so this, this map is produced by a 300 meter resolution forecast model. And you can see that some of the London airports are affected by fog on this day and some are not. And there's huge economic consequences to uh, to fog affecting the London airports, uh, particularly Heathrow, uh, which is running close to capacity all the time. So um, any disruption at Heathrow has massive economic consequences. Um, now, as things stand, um, I couldn't produce a map like that based on observational evidence because we just don't have the number of observations of visibility necessary to construct it. Now, what we do have is um, what I describe as conventional observing networks, which have served as well for, um, you know, well, since the dawn of meteorology, 100, 150 years in some cases, uh, we've had rain gauges and uh, thermometers. Um, but nowadays, of course, we've got a whole lot of other things as well, satellites, radars, um, lots of remote sensing instruments. But all these are sort of, you know, infrastructure heavy um, and they're very expensive to both um, install uh, and to run. So that's, that's sort of what we have. Now this, is, this diagram shows what, what's been happening in terms of trends in the resolution of both forecast model and some observation networks over the last sort of um, 40 years and also uh, looking ahead. So first of all, if you look at the red line, that is the actual, um, that is a, a representation of the 
the grid spacing on the UK operational forecast model. So when I, um, when I started my working career, the, the grid spacing over the UK for the forecast model was 100 kilometers. And today it's one and a half kilometers. So been nearly a two orders of magnitude increase in resolution over over that time. Now, for our conventional observing networks, um, th th there either has been very little change, or 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 where there has been change, it's not been two orders of magnitude. So, for example, if you look at the weather radar, for uh, as 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 possibly our highest resolution observing system, um, the, res the, the pixel size uh, in the late 70s was five kilometers, and it's now one kilometer. So it is, it is actually our only observing network, which is of comparable resolution to the forecast as things stand. And of course, radar doesn't measure everything, it measures rainfall mainly. Uh, and also provides some wind data. Um, so that's a, a that's a, a, a graphic representation of a of a problem that's developing, in that the the forecast resolution is improving rapidly, um, and the the conventional observing resolution, while some some aspects are improving other aspects are fairly static uh, and there is a uh, there is a, a an increasing gap between um, the scale of the forecast and the scale of the observations so i mentioned that there's a gap but why why is this a problem well we need observations to initialize the forecast model, uh, to monitor how it's doing, to verify the forecast, which is really important, um, and also to inform the model development. Now, if, if, if the gap is allowed to persist or widen even further, um, it's a problem. I mean, a very basic level, the forecasts won't be quite as good as they could be. Um, but there are other things as well. The If we can't verify the forecast, then there's a question about a credibility. Um, it means that any investment we make in improving the models is going to be devalued. And it also means we're wasting the huge computer resources that are going into running the high resolution models. Um, so what, what's, you know, what, how has this problem developed? Why, why, um, why am you be, be, being able to increase the observations density? Well, I think it's mainly down to um, uh, the difference between the rate at which uh, com computer power has increased compared to the rate at which the cost of observations has decreased. Uh, and also observations are, um, the cost of observations has got a, a, some fixed constraints which are very difficult to, um, very difficult to work around. So just to summarize the problem then, uh, for the first time in the history of the Met Office uh, and operational meteorology in general, we now have the ability to forecast weather in greater detail and we're able to observe it. Um, and so I think we need to take action to try and close this resolution gap. And we simply can't do that just by um, expanding our existing networks. 
um, it's it's not practical um, to find the millions of observing sites that we would need um, and it's not economically feasible and it's going to require innovation and it's going to require the ideas promoted by the, uh, the digital environment program and everything i've said so far is aligned very nicely with um, the aims of constructing a digital environment program if you look at the home page um, there's a statement there which more or less summarizes everything i've said so far so the the alignment between this problem in operational meteorology and the digital environment program is almost perfect. Okay, so so I've described the problem. So um, what what's the solution? Well, there are opportunities for solving this problem arising from a number of sources. Um, there's new technology, preparation of sensors, new measurement platforms, and new weather sensitivities. Uh, and I'm just going to describe um, each of these briefly in turn with some examples. So new technology, first of all. Well, there's, there's, I've just listed there some of the technologies which I believe are relevant to solving this problem. So I won't read those out. Hopefully it's fairly obvious. Um, and, you know, I think we, we've got examples of where we're using all those technologies to try and um, access new sources of data. Okay, as well as that, there is um, a real proliferation of sensors in society now, all sorts of um, uh, infrastructure and devices have sensors in them, which have some sensitivity to the weather. Um, even the washing machine there, even the humble washing machine has a pressure sensor in it. I've no idea whether the pressure sensor in a washing machine is of any practical use to, to meteorology or not. Um, but it just shows, you know, that there are sensors in everything. Uh, and obviously some of those sensors are highly capable. The, the radar in the nose of every civil aircraft is a highly capable radar, um, you know, and, and some of the sensors are, are fairly dumb, but uh, similarly, the, the, but even so there are a lot of them. Um, and potentially they're of value, like the, the light sensor in the top of most street lamps. And there are new measurement platforms. Now, what's really exciting here is that um, things like autonomous vehicles and mobile phones are or sorry, I should say connected and autonomous vehicles because it's not, you know, increasing number of cars are becoming connected um, now. Um, you know, before before we get to fully autonomous vehicles where, where connection will be essential. Um, but the exciting thing here is these these platforms uh, exist in their in their millions. And millions of observations is exactly what we need. Um, looking ahead um, to the possibility that there might be significant drone fleets in the future, well, drone fleets are very exciting as well because uh, they offer the possibility of measurements above the ground, which is, which is very important to weather forecasting. So just thinking about weather sensitivity, sensitivities in society, um, 
if you have a uh, if the weather has some impact on a system then potentially it's possible to uh, turn that impact into a source of observational data so there's one example there if you if you know how much power a wind turbine is generating then that is related um, to a greater or lesser extent to the to the wind experienced by the turbine so if we know the power can we can we turn it into a wind observation and um, you know, it, it, my instinctive uh, answer would be probably yes um, it's something we don't do at the moment. Uh, we've tried doing this sort of thing with, with other weather impacts. It, it's normally a lot more difficult than you might think, um, but um, there is potential there. So um, here's another example uh, where, you know, uh, when the wind blows things over and uh, including lorries sometimes, um, so you think, well, if we if we had access to a data set which showed um, lorries blowing, wh whether lorries were blowing over or not, could we infer something about the gust speed? But obviously, the, the answer here is is completely different. The answer is probably not because it it's probably a, a highly non-linear system, and the physics is just probably just too complicated to. Uh, uh to get back to anything about the wind um okay so i've talked about um reverse engineering of weather impacts i've talked about new technology and um i've talked about new platforms um but there's another way of looking at it so uh you can classify opportunities in terms of whether they're crowdsourced data, citizen science data, third party data or opportunistic. And each, each of these different approaches uh, have, brings their challenges. Um, the, the thing I want to focus on uh, for the rest of the talk is probably the opportunistic um, approach. Uh, the repurposing of data because it, it's the, in this area that we've had actually greatest success uh, at trying to close this this resolution gap uh, and it probably um, uh, is going to be the most cost effective area uh, of, of R&D So what what makes um, what makes a successful source of observational data? What 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 needs? Uh, what are the necessary conditions for success? Well, I think there are three. Um, the most obvious is that the data has to be useful. Um, in particular, is it going to be useful for helping us to resolve more detail in the atmosphere? Um, because then it, it offers the possibility of being able to improve the forecast as well. So that's the most obvious condition. The, but the, the second condition, which um, is obviously important, is is the method going to be technical, technically feasible? Um, is it going to work well enough? Um, but the, the last condition is the affordability of the data. And this um, experience suggests that this affordability question is actually um, quite critical to a number of ideas. Uh, we've had more ideas um, um, thwarted because of uh, a difficulty of creating a business model that works uh, than we have worrying about the technical feasibility. Often the technical bit is actually the, the, the easy bit uh, of, of finding new observational data. It's the affordability which, which causes the, the big headaches. Um, but you, you can see 
with all with those three constraints, um, it's quite difficult to identify op opportunities which which are going to be work which are going to work and are going to make it through right through from idea right through into operations. So thinking a bit more about the data utility. Um, It'd be nice if we had a requirement for some data, say we wanted more humidity data from the lower atmosphere, for example, uh, and then we we uh, somehow think of a way of of acquiring this data. Well, of course, with with this more opportunistic type approach, I mean that's just it's just not never going to work like that. You have to. Um, you got, you know, this is a world of, of 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 second best solutions. You have to accept what data is out there, uh, and try and um, try and make the best use of it. So it's it's you've, there's going to be compromises in in what you obtain. It's um, so I've suggested here that instead of humidity, what we can what is probably easier to to get data on is actually the refractivity of the atmosphere, which is related to humidity. And, and it's something which can be exploited. So these, these, this is just the list of the sort of questions you've got to consider uh, when you're thinking about a new data source. Um, just sort of obvious, obvious questions really to ask. Thinking about the technical feasibility, um, I put up here the the NERC technology readiness level um, scale from from one to nine. Um, now the Met Office, being a an operating authority, um, ideally would would um, really be look to get involved at things when when they get towards the sort of the the top end of the scale towards operational implementation um, you know uh, TRL 6 and above um, but but I have to say that um, in this in this area of uh, opportunistic observations and operational observations um, we, we found that there are remarkably few actually uh, groups in universities, in UK universities, working on this sort of, of data. Um, and the Met Office has been, um, we've, we've really been, been forced to do work ourselves at quite low um, TRL. Um, well, which is, which is um, we, well, it, personally, I've, I've found it, extremely you know um, extremely rewarding myself because I, I I think this work at low TRLs is um, well I've said there that's the that's the fun bit in in my book you know the um, but um, yeah no there is um there is a, a surprising um, a surprising number of opportunities to work in in this sort of area that that uh, it's it's not a crowded space at the moment I would say. And yeah, a few words about data affordability. I said from our experience, this is this is often the most difficult thing. Um, Uh, the, the successes we've had so far have mainly been with either um, finding data that's that's um, either open and published, or data that can be intercepted um, uh, and obtained for free through through interception. Right now, uh, get to the, finally get to the, the meat of it, I suppose, which is um, I, you know I've 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 going to describe some examples now. Uh, I think I've got two successes and two failures. Um, when I say failures, I mean failures so far. They hopefully 
the failures can be turned into successes one day, but um, they're not there yet. Okay, so um, the first success the Met Office ever had with using opportunistic type data um, was uh, obtaining measurements of water vapor using the Ordnance Survey network of GNSS receivers. Um, and this became operational about, ooh, must be nearly 10 years ago now. Um, so what the idea here is that the that water vapor in the atmosphere um, changes the propagation speed of GNSS signals from the satellites. And if you have a very good uh, receiver and the Ordnance Survey have a network of high quality receivers um, around the UK, if you have a very good network, you, a very good receiver, you can measure the, the, uh, the delay in the signals caused by water vapor in the atmosphere. And so we get these uh, delay measurements from, uh, I think it's about 100 receivers um, in, the, in the Ordnance Survey network. Um, and we turn that into a, a measurement of um, integrated water vapor. Uh, and that's used, that's been used in the operational forecast models for, um, for an, a number of years now. So that was the first success that we had. Um, but that is only that is only a hundred sites. That's not that's not massive in terms of resolution. Um, now, more recently, um, we've had a, well, I would describe this as a, a, a more spectacular success. Um, so uh, all civil aircraft um, are emitting uh, or are, are broadcasting navigational data um, every few seconds uh, of various types, um, some of it for um, anti-collision purposes, uh, some of it for to inform air traffic control of their uh, what they're doing and what they're intending to do, and um, uh, amateur uh, plane enthusiasts have been intercepting these broadcasts um, for years, um, and there's. Um, uh, there's equipment in the uh, on the market uh, for them to receive uh, and decode uh, these data broadcasts and um, and display them. And you're probably all familiar, or a lot of people will be familiar with websites like Flight Radar 24, um, which um, use uh, networks of amateur receivers. Um, to aggregate the data and, and generate plots of aircraft positions and so on. Um, but um, so what uh, what the Met Office has been able to do um, uh, is use these data broadcasts to generate measurements of wind and temperature. Um, so using just five well, no, I think we've probably got more than five now, but um, a, ne a network of a handful of receivers in the UK uh, is generating a huge volume of data. We're getting measurements from every aircraft in UK airspace every few seconds. Um, and there's a... Um, there's an article about this on the Digital Environment um, website, and I've provided the link there. Um, so yeah, as I say, we get about 10 million wind observations per day, uh, and that's more than an order of magnitude, uh, more than from all other sources of wind data 
put together. So this has been a massive, this, this is a massive source of data. Um, and it actually produced a tangible improvement in, in the UK weather forecast skill, um, which is quite unusual just from, um, just from a change in an observation network to produce a, a sort of discernible improvement in the, in the weather forecast skill. Um, and if you assume that uh, this is a bit of a gross assumption, but if you assume that the uh, the benefit from UK weather forecasts scales linearly with forecast skill, um, then that that's equivalent to about a 10 million uh, per annum benefit to the UK economy. Um, so. Um, you know, I would say the methods promoted by the Digital Environment Programme really do work and they, they can have a, you know, make a very tangible uh, benefit. Um, so, um, yeah, but the, the, the thing is, we need to repeat this trick um, many times over. Um, and it's not proved so easy to do that. So that brings us neatly on to, um, you know, uh, some struggles. So um, as I say, we need to repeat the trick we've done with the, with the aircraft data. Uh, and one obvious area uh, where we lack data is data, is data from over the sea. Um, we badly need uh, to do something equivalent in, in the marine domain. And it's, we recognize it's not easy um, because um, over the sea at low levels, I mean, you've got the aircraft flying, um, you know, at cruise altitude and so on, which is fine, uh, but we need data from lower down as well. Um, and there are not so many opportunities for all the reasons I, I've listed there. Um, but, um, you know, it's not like there are no opportunities at all, because um, one of the things uh, we, uh, we can see is that there are lots of, um, lots of small boats and, uh, around the UK, lots of yachts, uh, and most of those yachts um, have some uh, meteorological sensors in particular uh, a masthead anemometer. So that's Torquay Marina and there are probably about 40 anemometers in that in that picture. And and they're good, you know, they're good quality uh, instruments because they're normally there to um, help with navigation and the uh, self-steering gear. So you know they they're they're well maintained, they're good quality instruments. Uh, but at the moment, the data doesn't go anywhere apart from uh, uh, it stays on the yacht. Um, and there's a picture of Plymouth Marina with a similar number of anemometers. Uh, and obviously, hopefully, these yachts spend a certain proportion of their time at sea. Um, and so there's potential for quite a bit of data. So um, even better, um, there's a virtually free way of getting the data back to shore, uh, which is the um, marine AIS system. Uh, AIS is basically an anti-collision system. Um, but there are slots in the AIS broadcast messages for environmental data. And um, in principle, it would be possible to interface the yacht anemometers to the AIS transponders. The AIS transponders then broadcast the data, which is then picked up by um, receivers on shore and, and the data can be um, uh, transmitted uh, to uh, whoever uh, would like to use it. Um, it's not 
prove to be that easy to make this happen um, because uh, a number of uh, a number of things need to be in place uh, to make this work and um, at the moment we haven't been able to uh, get a consortium together um, to uh, get as far as a, a, a demonstration project um, so but it looks like it's technically feasible um, data utility probably unknown at the moment i think it's fair to say um, but the, again the 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 main thing that we need to work on is is a business model that works for the the yacht owners uh in particular um right so but we're still working on it we haven't uh, we haven't given up we haven't given up okay so another one where we've run into a problem with the business model is um is this idea which actually actually an an idea that's been around for oh must be about 20 years um uh and this was a this was something that was developed um, probably first in the UK actually. Um, so this is an I the idea that um, you the the backhaul links that the mobile phone networks use. So that's for communication between base stations. Um, they have to use to get the to get the data rates that they need they have to use fairly high frequencies which attenuate in rain and if you uh if you know the attenuation on a these backhaul links you can then uh, derive the the rainfall the average rainfall or the integrated rainfall along that link and because there are so many uh, mobile phone base stations, you can actually generate, uh, uh, if you have attenuation data from all the links, you can actually generate a rainfall map. Uh, and you can see there, these are maps produced um, in Holland, uh, where they've, um, they've successfully um, implemented this technique. Um, and so you know technically there's no problem it's been it's been shown it's been shown to work uh, the problem is that in the uk we we have failed to get access to the data um it doesn't it doesn't come at no cost to collect these data for the for the network the phone network operators uh and at the moment we just haven't got a business model that works for both the data users and and the network um, operators um, so um, yeah a number of people have, have had a go at this in the uk over the uh, over the years um, but uh, we haven't been able to uh, unlock the door yet so that's a that's another example where uh, of a of a a uh, failure i don't think uh, i think the situation i think everybody's given up at the moment on this i don't think anybody's actively trying to uh, trying to solve this but um yeah with i mean with with the introduction of 5g um when probably the density of base stations will be even higher um the opportunity um the opportunity is growing um so hopefully one day it'll it'll come off okay right so uh so the last section really is um well i'm gonna there's a the next slide is a summary but also there's the question um is this going to work <laughs> so 
I've said that new sources of observational data are really vital to support future weather forecasting in future. Um, I've said that I've focused on opportunistic data, but there's citizen science as well, um, third party data, and probably we're going to need a combination of all of these to solve the, the, the resolution gap. Um, we have some successes, and as I've shown, uh, some of the successes are quite big and have made a tangible impact on weather forecasting. But I have to say, I have to admit that on the current trajectory, um, we're not going to close the resolution gap. And it, particularly when we move to the next generation of weather forecasting models, which uh, plan to have a resolution of um, sort of 300 meters or less around 2030, this the gap will significantly widen. Um, and so, um, Uh, if we're going to change things, if we're going to change that outcome, then then we need to do something uh, now, basically. So, um, so what the Met Office is trying to do is it's trying to encourage an acceleration of um, R and D, um, particularly at this in the low and medium TRL level, where we where we think that that uh, we need to do more. Um, so the Met Office has um, uh, a number of formal Met Office uh, academic partnerships, um, which at the moment uh, we partner with about five universities and the, the partnership mainly covers um, the field of weather and climate forecasting. So the, the partnerships uh, are being expanded to include additional universities and the scope is expanded to, uh, uh, to cover this, this area of opportunistic observations. Um, so, uh, I mean, of course, we collaborate with, with lots of universities at the moment uh, but there are additional benefits to these these formal academic partnerships in terms of in terms of funding. Um, so, uh, if anybody uh, if anybody listening is uh, in a university and might be interested in in investigating these these partnerships, then then I provided a link there. Uh, I think that the tendering process is, is open at the moment, so it's a good time to think about it. Um, and of course, the other thing to do is publicize this as an issue. Um, and just the scale of the, you know, the scale of the impacts that, uh, that can be achieved in this, in this area of R&D, uh, which I guess is what I'm doing today. So, yeah. With that, uh, I think that's my last slide. Yep, thank you. Uh, thanks for listening and uh, happy to take questions. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Malcolm, for a, a fascinating talk there. Really good stuff, thank you. Um, there are a few questions in the in the Q&A, which we'll, we'll go through now, if that's okay. Um, and the first is when, when you're taking advantage of opportunistic or citizen science um, census, is there any limitations to this caused by the accuracy of the of the data that you get from those um uh yeah the short answer is is yes i mean um take for example the um uh and sometimes we have to do a lot of work on the data to um uh to get it into a usable form so um for example with the aircraft data um uh you know as, as it comes, the data are unusable uh, because of issues with the data. Uh, for one thing, surprisingly, the aircraft, aircraft, civil aircraft, don't know where they're heading to within a few degrees. Um, so we have to correct for um, 
heading errors in the in the aircraft. Um, the temperatures are also um, uh, not brilliant quality, uh, and we have to we have to average do a lot of averaging to get to get usable temperatures. Um, so yeah, there are nearly always issues with accuracy. It's a it's a constant battle. Yeah, cool. Thanks, for that. Um, and then, then we had a, a, a comment followed by a question, and the comment was just around the, the issue with not enough people working on this as a peer review process and the utility of opportunistic sensing divided the academic community for over a decade and so funding has been difficult to obtain. Um, and for the same reason, publishing has been a challenge, but that's improving. Uh, we're world leading in Internet of Things and AI, but been held back by the old ways of focusing on making ever more precise measurements, which, as Malcolm has said, is just not happening. And then I guess the question related to that is, is there potential for organizations like the Met Office to endorse opportunistic approaches so that they could be accepted more as a, a standard? Um, yeah, I think I think there are a number of reasons why, um, why it's relatively difficult to, um, to work in this area. Um, I think one of the reasons is it's, um, it, it sort of falls between lots of lots of things. You know, it's it's not it's not meteorology, um, and you know, it's a bit of lots of things. It's a bit of technology. It's a bit of meteorology or atmospheric science. It's a bit of data science, and I think quite often it doesn't have a natural home. Um, and it doesn't have a natural home in UKRI either because you know, you're not learning new things about the atmosphere in general. So, so you know, is, is that NERC um, or is it EPSRC? Um, uh, so that, I think that is, a, that is an important issue. And, and that's what's really good about the digital environment program, actually, because it, it does this work does sit absolutely squarely in the digital environment program. It, you know, um, um, so, sorry, what was the second? What was the second bit? Um, I guess it, I mean it was whether whether the the Met Office can in some way endorse the opportunistic approaches to so so that they can become accepted more as a, a sort of standard um, for doing things. Yeah, well, well, I think hopefully the examples I've given shows shows that we are absolutely open to um, data from wherever you know I don't think we um, you know I don't think we have any uh, don't think we place any barriers on, on where data comes from um, at all I can't you know that I mean obviously You know, there is a sort of um, there are different tiers of observations. So, you know, the highest, the highest, the very highest quality observations you're going to need for maintaining things like the climate record. Um, but we recognise that you know it's unrealistic to um, unrealistic to expect all observations to get to that higher standard so um you know we do we do promote this sort of tiered approach where um uh, where what we need is you know what we need the problem i've, I've been describing is all about getting very high volumes of data um and even if it's not the highest quality um it it can reveal it can be you processed to provide useful information for the for the weather forecasting, the you know the day to day forecasting. Okay. Um, the the next question was: um, are, are there data sets that are a priority for improving forecasts? For example, is high resolution rainfall data going to be of more impact than high resolution wind data? Um, yeah, there are there are priorities and. Um, the the highest priority at the moment 
is um, humidity or water vapour um, above the ground. Uh, we have very few methods of uh, of getting humidity data from above the ground. There are, there are very few aircraft in, um, which have um, humidity sensors installed. We have the balloon-borne radio sons, which are launched from a few stations um, once or twice a day. But but there is there is a serious lack of, of humidity data, and it's very difficult. It's very difficult to um, uh, to fix that because it's just not easy. It's not that easy to measure humidity. You know, it's either the sensors are either expensive or um, uh, yeah, ex ex it's expensive and, and difficult to work with. Sure, thanks, Will. Um, the, the next question is, what, what about uh, WOW? Because this could be quite dense with lots of enthusiastic amateurs. Yeah. Does that fit yeah. in? Yeah, I, I didn't mention WOW because, you know, I, my, my uh, I mean, WOW is sort of like citizen science type approach. I mean, WOW's, WOW's very successful. Um, uh, so for, for people that um, maybe haven't come across it, so WOW is a, a sort of... Um, uh, a website for collecting data from amateur uh, weather stations. And um, there are about a thousand UK weather stations uh, in people's back gardens connected to WOW. Um, and there, there are other port, there are other similar portals as well. Um, you know, WOW is not, not unique. Um, and, it, and, it's, and it's really good. It, it works. Um, because we've got about 300 professional weather stations uh, in the UK. So having a thousand more amateur ones is really useful. Uh, and the data is, data is used. It's not, it's not used in the operational forecast model yet, but it is used by forecasters to um, uh, monitor, the, the, monitor the weather in real time. Um, and it, uh, but it, but it is limited to a thousand. Um, uh, you, you know, it's um, it's thousands, uh, well, a thousand, and actually, the sort of observations I'm interested in, we need millions. <laughs> Okay. Um, one one final question. Um, so for, for the last 40 years, at least, forecast resolution and accuracy has increased in a predictable way. Um, and you've shown convincingly that observations are losing in this race. Um, however, with the end of Moore's law, we cannot expect such easy wins for forecast model resolution in the future. So do you think this gives observations a chance to catch up? Uh, well, I hope so. Yeah, I, ho I hope we're going to catch up anyway, just through our own efforts, but, uh, or through the digital environment program. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, and it's, and it's successes, but uh, yeah, I, I don't know. I, um, I, I, I don't know. I can't. I, uh, I, I just, I just, I don't know. I wouldn't like to say how it's going to go. Uh, I mean, uh, I think people have been forecasting the demise of Moore's law for for a while, haven't they? Yeah, that's right. I think it, it has it has demised, if that's the right word. But uh, yeah, um, yeah. Okay, brilliant. Thank you, Malcolm. Um, in the the interest of time, we we better stop there. But thank you very much for that fascinating stuff and and for taking those questions. Um, very much appreciated.